it will load the notes so that you can follow along. And I'm going to go ahead and do that here as well because there's a few times today where I'm going to want to show you some things on the screen. So we are beginning lesson 179 and I just want to kind of say a couple things about it before we really get rolling, okay? Um, some people out there, I think, um, don't understand what I'm doing. They think that what we're doing in this class is I'm trying to somehow like redefine the King James or say the King James needs to be replaced or something along those lines. And that's, that's not at all what I'm doing. Um, I am a traditional text, Texas Receptus, King James Bible advocate. And what I, my goal in all of this has been is to present the true history. The problem I have, if you guys were in my office at home, I have a whole section all the way up to the ceiling of books just about the King James Bible that have been written by King James Bible advocates that, is, that are full of information. And unfortunately, a lot of the information in those books is not accurate. It is not right. They are, there are historical errors. There are things that are said about the King James Bible that are just frankly not true. So one of the things that I've been wanting to do is to set forth some history here that is careful that is responsible and that is evidential based upon what has been left behind by the translators. I will repeat this later, I'll probably say it again, that the King James movement left the station, the King James train left the station as it is currently constituted now, currently, in the 1950s without a working knowledge of the information that we've been presenting here over the last nearly 50 lessons. And so as a result, they have said things about the King James Bible in their defense of it that are just simply not true. And so one of my goals has been to try to clear that up through the teaching of these lessons, as well as just present information that I think a story here needs to be told. And I think the real story is much more accurate. So you should have in front of you Lesson 179, Pre-1611 Evidence for the Text, The General Meeting, and the Notes of John Boyce. Okay? So let's look at the introduction. When this class last met on May 15, we concluded our discussion of the primary work in progress document known as BOD 1602. Okay, and again, that is this document right here. This is in the possession of the Bodleian Library in uh, England, and it is a 1602 Bishop's Bible with the handwritten notes of the translators in the margin. We spent a ton of time covering this. We talked about the Old Testament. We talked about the New Testament. We talked about how you can know that this is, in fact, the, um, uh, the, the work of the translators. Still getting error messages. I'm going to turn down this audio a little bit more. Don't want to be clipping out. So, that's what we talked about last. Please recall that Bot 1602 is a copy of a 1602 Bishop's Bible in the possession of the Bodleian Library with the handwritten notations of the translators in the margin. In Lessons 162 and 163, we began analyzing the pre-1611 evidence for the text of the authorized version by looking at the surviving primary work-in-progress documents that have been discovered in British libraries in the middle of the 20th century. These documents included, number one, Manuscript 98. So that's this one right here. Remember, we went over this one in great detail as well. This was prepared by the Second Westminster Company that worked on the New Testament epistles that go, works in conjunction with a 1602 Bishop's Bible and then ultimately a 1611. I explained all of that in a bevy of lessons which we'll be mentioning here shortly. So the first one is Manuscript 98, the handwritten manuscript prepared by the Second Westminster Company that worked on the New Testament epistles. Second is Bod 1602, the complete 1602 Bishop's Bible containing handwritten annotations for much of the Old Testament and the Gospels, and again, that's this document right here that I have on the screen behind me. And then thirdly, the notes of John Boyce. Handwritten notes of John Boyce from the general meeting covering the New Testament epistles and the book of Revelation, right? In lessons 162 and 163, I said that we would consider each of these documents in terms of the following three categories. The first of these categories were discussed in lessons 162 and 163. And those categories are, number one, scholarly awareness and published access. Second, physical description and contents. And third, impact on the readings found in the King James Bible. 
So we have done that now for Manuscript 98 and Bob 1602 and spent a considerable amount of time doing it. We could have spent more time, but I think we have spent a sufficient enough amount of time to look at it in detail so that people can get an understanding of what took place. Then in Lessons 164 and 165, we deviated from my original plan to talk about two additional primary work in progress documents that were unknown to me prior to January of this year, 2022. These documents included the following. Number one, Manuscript Ward B. In the possession of Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, this is Samuel Ward's personal draft work on First Edoras and Wisdom chapters three through four from the Apocryphal section. This is the earliest known draft work on the King James Bible. This is his personal work. We talked about that in Lesson 164. We also have mentioned in 165, Manuscript Bury 363 in the British Library. This contains three unpublished letters between Frenchman Isaac Casaubon and King James Bible translator John Boyce. These letters date from late 1610 or early 1611 i.e. very late in the process utilized by the translators, possibly during the general meeting itself. So go to the top page two. In Lesson 166, we resumed our study of Manuscript 98 by looking at its physical description and contents. Then in Lesson 167, 168, 169, and 170, we discussed the impact of Manuscript 98 upon King James, uh, upon reading Scar... Let me read that over. We discussed the impact of Manuscript 98 upon King James readings by looking at Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 13, other miscellaneous passages, and the question of printer errors. So we spent a lot of time looking at Manuscript 98. Then, in Lesson 171, we began our consideration of Bod 1602. All told, we studied the following regarding this important document. Number one, physical description and contents in Lesson 171. Number two, impact on King James Old Testament readings, lessons 172, 173, and 174, and then impact on King James New Testament readings, lesson 175, 176, and 177. And then we had some final thoughts on the impact of Bot 1602 on the King James Bible in lesson 178. So that brings us now up to where we are today with lesson 179. Now look, guys, I understand that if I were giving you a test, you probably would not pass it because there's so much stuff that we've covered here, all right? I might not even be able to pass my own test, to be honest with you. I have forgotten probably more of this than I realize that I have forgotten as we've gone through this information. But we've tried to be thorough, complete, and succinct and strike a balance between giving enough information for people to clearly understand and see what happened and going too much and going too far, so to speak, into the minutia. So, in the current lesson, we will begin an examination of the notes of John Boyce, the third and final primary work in progress document uh, from where we left off in Lesson 163. All right? Now, before we go any further, does anybody have any questions? So that's all review. So if you're sitting there and your mind is boggling, just say to yourself, okay, I know where I can get that information if I want it. You don't need to necessarily remember every jot and tittle of it, but we're going to move on, though, with an understanding that we've covered all that ground, right? That doesn't mean that you should switch it off and, you know, there's nothing for you because I still believe each one of these lessons has its own relevant information for you to, uh, to, to, to think about and to grasp. So, that brings us then to, on page two, review the notes of John Boyce as our first sort of main point. <clears throat> we should, I think, have the word the in front of that sentence, Mike. What do you think? Um, no, let's just leave it. Notes of Boyce. Yeah, it should say the notes of John Boyce had been lost to history. Oh, the word review should that be. No, we're good with that. Okay. Okay. The notes of John Boyce had been lost to history. F. H. A. Scribner noted in his 1884 book, The Authorized Edition of the English Bible, 1611, that Boyce and he alone had taken notes on the general meeting at Stationers Hall during the years 1610-1611. Gustavus Payne, or Gustavus Payne, also included a photograph 
And some remarks on John Boyce and his notes in his 1959 work, The Learned Men. So let's stop right there. The notes that we're about to talk about had been lost to history. Scrivener mentioned them briefly in his book from 1884, but it was a mention. Just that Boyce and he alone had taken notes on what happened at the general meeting of the King James Bible. Okay. And then Gust Gustavus Payne, in his 1959 book, had a picture of the notes with some very sort of brief information. Not much was said, all right? So, scholar that brings us then to scholarly awareness. You understand, do people have to be aware of something's existence and where to find it before they can study it, okay? So, by and large, Boyce's notes were completely lost to history until the late 1950s, 1960s, when they were rediscovered first by Gustavus Payne in 1959 and then Ward Allen, who we'll be talking about here shortly, okay? So, scholarly awareness. Ward Allen, in his night, Ward Allen, excuse me, in the mid 1960s, working with the library of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, was able to locate and confirm a copy of Boyce's notes. Allen published a preliminary description of the document in the winter of 1969 edition of the Renaissance News. Now, I know you all read the Renaissance News, especially back in the 1960s, right? Okay. Now, who reads the Renaissance News? Probably a bunch of academic eggheads sitting around in an ivory tower that want to know and keep up on the state of research in Renaissance literature, okay? So, it's 1969 when Ward Allen first sort of announces publicly that a copy of Boyce's notes have been found, all right? And he does so in an article in the winter of 1969 in the Renaissance News. Publish access. So, later that year, in 1969, Allen granted public access to the document via the publication of Translating for King James, Notes Made by a Translator of the King James Bible. That is this book right here. Translating for King James. This is Ward Allen's 1969 publication of the Notes of John Boyce. Okay, So this late 1969 is finally published in book form. All right, Allen's book contained images of the document along with an English translation of its entirety. So let me just show you that. And you can basically open up to any page, and here is what the book has, okay? On this column right here is a photograph of Boyce's notes, and then on the facing page is a translation into English. So he has the copy, he's got photographs of the copy that was found in the Corpus Christi Library, and then he's got an English translation on the facing page for the entirety of Boyce's Notes, published in 1969, okay? Now, has the King James train, so to speak, already left the station at this point? Yes, J.J. Ray has already written his book, Ruckman has already written his early books, um, there's uh, Edward F. Hills has already written his books. There's stuff that is already in print. It is the next year, 1970, David Otis Fuller is going to release his book, Which Bible? So my point is that these guys have left the station, so to speak, without a working knowledge of what? Boyce's Notes. Okay? In, 1960, in 1996... Professor David Norton announced the discovery of a second copy of Boyce's Notes, manuscript Harl 750 in the British Library. It, it is his piece for the, for the um, library titled John Boyce's Notes on the Revision of the King James Bible New Testament, a new manuscript, and that is this essay right here that I have in my hand is the other one that is done by uh, Professor Norton in 1996, announcing a second copy. So by the time we get to the end of the 1990s, there are now two known copies of Boyce's Notes. All right. Um, next point. The story is best told by Ward S. Allen, the original publisher of the document, in the preface to the 1969 publication, Translating for King James, Notes Made by a Translator of the King James Bible. So again, that is this book right here. 
in the preface, he has a description of how he came to, to uh, realize and discover the document. Let's look at his story. It's quite interesting. <clears throat> he says, quote, The story of the publication of John Boyce's notes is a simple one. Some years ago, I learned through Dr. F.H.A. Scribner's book, the authorized edition of the English Bible, 1611, from 1884, that John Boyce, one of the translators of the authorized version, had made notes while the company of review, while the company of review, of which he was a member, prepared the final edition of the translators at Stationers Hall during the years 1610-1611. Boyce and he only made notes as the company deliberated over the final version. <clears throat> From time out of memory, the notes had been lost. So as I said earlier, Scrivener mentions them, that Boyce did this, but even Scrivener, did he know where they were or how to get his hands on them or look at them himself? The answer is no, he did not. Okay, <clears throat> so they had been largely lost for nearly, well, the better part of 350 years, almost, nearly, okay? Next paragraph. For one who had beguiled leisure hours in puzzling over the revision that the translators of the authorized version had formed in their edition out of previous translations, the dream of recovering the lost notes floated as an unembodied joy. Dr. Dr. Scrivener nourished the dream with the conjecture that someday lost notes would perhaps turn up in a private collection. Long after I had abandoned hope of glimpsing the notes forever, it happened that they fell my way full body. A photograph and some remarks on John Boyce and his notes in Gustavus Payne's book, The Learned Men, 1959, gave me hope that a true copy of the notes rested in the Bodleian Library. Mr. T. H. Ashton, the librarian of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, was kind enough to furnish me with a photographic copy of the manuscript which Mr. Payne had described. A close study has convinced me that manuscript CCC 312 exhibits substantially a section, at least, of the notes which Boyce made at Stationers Hall. The notes appear on 39 manuscript pages, 61 through 80. Now that means their manuscript means their hand what? Their handwritten, okay? and are concerned with the problems of translating biblical passages from Romans through Revelation with addenda concerning 1 Corinthians through Revelation. I published a preliminary description of these notes in the Renaissance News, Winter, and we need to... I made a mistake earlier. It should have been 1966. The first date, Mike, on the previous page. 1966 is the correct date for the Renaissance News article. On the previous page, I think I had 69 yeah. by accident, okay? The winter of 1966, with the hope that if any scholar doubted the authenticity of the notes, they would make their doubts known. Several scholars, biblical, literary, and classical, were kind enough to write me, expressing their conviction that the notes which I had described and argued were indeed a good copy of the lost notes. The introduction to this book adds to the evidence in the article an elaborate study uh, which has as its simple or single end, excuse me, to demonstrate that the notes which are reproduced in this book are a good copy of those notes which John Boyce made at Stationers Hall. So Alan, in the book now, is he describing the fact that he has found it? He found it in 66. He spent three years submitting it to scholarly review and scrutiny, and after after concluding that they were a good copy, does he move forward in 1969 with publishing the book? Okay, everybody following this chronology. A second copy of Boyce's notes was discovered in the mid 1990s in the British Library by Dr. David Norton. Norton wrote about it in his 1996 essay for the library titled "John Boyce John Boyce's Notes on the Revision of the King James Bible New Testament." a new manuscript. Therefore, there are two known copies of Boyce's note. There are there are two mm, we need to take out that second yeah. known. Yeah. The first one or the second one? Either one. Okay. So let's take out the second one. Therefore there are two known copies of Boyce's notes to historians. 
The first one is the Fulman Manuscript, discovered by Ward Allen in the mid-1960s and reproduced in his 1969 book, Translating for King James, and manuscript Harl 750, discovered by David Norton in the mid-1990s and discussed in his 1996 piece for the library. So let's go to the next page. So this first, top page four. The following image is of the Fulman Manuscript by Ward S. Allen in his 1969 book, Translating for King James, Notes Made by King James Translator, okay? So, I'm gonna try to zoom in on that about as far as I can go. So here you can see, this is a discussion, if my memory doesn't uh, fail me, on 1 Corinthians 13, I believe, is the passage that the notes are on in this case. So you can see, chapter 13, verse one. 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 Then you have Greek text written. Then you have Biza is mentioned. Scolia is mentioned. You have the initial AD here. So what Boyce is doing is he is capturing the conversation that is happening at the general meeting around that verse. Okay? This is <clears throat> in Greek, Latin, and English. Each, the notes are written in Greek, Latin, and English. So that should give you some indication of the kind of scholar that Boyce was. He can sit there, overhear a conversation that is happening in real time, and take notes on it in three languages. Okay? I mean, this guy is no dum-dum. Now, I'm thinking I was wrong, because if you scroll down, 1 Corinthians starts here, so I will therefore correct myself and say that I believe this note is on Romans 13, verse 1, not 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Because if we go down the page, on the same page, do we have an indication that he's now beginning the notes on 1 Corinthians? Okay, so he is taking notes on the portion from Romans to Revelation and writing the notes down as the conversation is taking place and he's doing it in three languages Latin, Greek, and English. All right. Now, that is the image. So that is the same image. That image is taken from what is called the Fulman Manuscript and that is the manuscript that is reproduced by Ward Allen in his 1969 book right here. Okay. Let's go to the next page. On the next page, the following is an image of the second known copy of Boyce's Notes, manuscript Harl 750, discovered in 1996 by Dr. David Norton. The document is in the possession of the British Library and is discussed uh, in Dr. Norton's essay, and I've already told you the title of that twice, but I want you to see here, is the formatting of these notes slightly different? So here we have the same thing, chapter 1, verse 1. Here's the note. The contents of the note are the same, okay? Here's AD, here's the initials, here's Scolia, here's Visa. Is the contents the same if you compare the two images, okay? They're just laid out differently on the page. So there are two known copies of Boyce's notes. One, Fulman, the Fulman manuscript, and then this manuscript, Harl 750, they contain the same information, and then if you go down here, you can see again, do we see the beginning of 1 Corinthians? So it's the same content, copied by a different scribe of the same information. So if you go to British libraries right now, there are two known copies of Boyce's notes. One, the Fulman manuscript that it was published by Ward Allen in his book, and the second one is, is covered by um, Dr. David Norton in his essay for the library. And again, we can show pictures. Here is Norton's essay, and there's the image that I have on the screen in the notes. Got it right out of his essay, and you can see at the bottom of the picture that I gave him credit for it, what page it came from, okay? So, that's what we are talking about. So I think maybe we should pause there and see if anybody has any questions before we start page six. Does anybody have any questions? Do we know how the library got these notes? Um, 
The short answer is we do not definitively know. Some educated guesses can be probably put forth that I plan on getting to in a future lesson. Um, particularly as it relates to the Fullman manuscript, the one that was published by Ward Allen in 1969. So the answer is yes and no. They are in caches of other manuscript documents that at some point had been bequeathed to these libraries. Were these libraries around back then? Oh yeah. Particularly the, the university libraries. The British Library, I don't, I don't remember the date, but I don't think the British Library was around then. But the British Library has come by all sorts of things over the years, and, and that's just it. Like some of these libraries have, they, don't, they have so much stuff they don't even know what's in some of the stuff because nobody has taken the time to go and look through all of it. So there could be more stuff pertaining to the King James Bible floating around a British library somewhere, and we just don't know it right now. And we know, to, 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 uh, to that point, um, we do know that in the last decade, between 2010 and 2020, and 2020, that's when the Kasuban voice notes were discovered, and that is also when... Um, that manuscript of uh, Samuel Ward's independent translation of those apocryphal books was discovered. So as recently as within the last decade, stuff, more things have been discovered. So I'm fairly confident that there's still information out there to be found related to this topic. Now, it is also commonly said that a lot of it was destroyed in the Great London Fire of 1666 because... Um, there's a note somewhere, I'm going from memory, I can't remember where, describing the London fire and how a lot of documents pertaining to the uh, late, what would have been the latest translation, i.e. the King James, were destroyed because they were in this one building that burned during the, 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 uh, the Great London Fire. The statistics on the Great London Fire are amazing, like two-thirds of the city of London basically burned to the ground uh, during that fire. So it, there, there's a, a lot of it's sort of common knowledge that probably a lot of a, a cache of that material was lost. But we do still have what we have, and it does tell us a lot about what happened. Any other questions? Okay. So it is important to note then, though, that neither the Fullman manuscript nor M.S. Harl 750 are the original copy of Boyce's notes. They are copies of Boyce's notes. The original, if you will, we don't know where it is. We don't know if it still exists. They are copies of Boyce's notes. So somebody sat down and hand copied. Now we can tell, we can tell, know, and identify by comparing the two copies that we have that they're of the same thing. Okay, but there are the two copies that we have are not the original. Subsequent to granting published access to the Fullman manuscript via the publication of his 1969 work translating for King James, notes made by a translator of the King James Bible, Ward Allen published a paperback edition in 1993. Dated August 1993, the paperback edition contains its own preface. So there is a unique preface in the paperback edition from 93 that was not in the first edition of 1969. Okay? Dated August 1993, the paperback edition contains its own preface. In this preface, Dr. Allen discusses the impact the original 1996 publication had upon scholarly works, author, scholarly works by. by authors on the King James Bible in the intermittent 20 plus years. So, let me explain. If a book like this is going to emerge on the scene in 1969, is it going to impact the way scholars are looking at what happened with the King James Bible. So between 1969 and 1993, the publication of this book was used by other scholars who were writing about other things related to the King James Bible. Okay? In this preface, Dr. Allen discusses this. So he says, quote, Since the original print of Translating for King James, many studies of the notes have suggested their various uses. An important examination of Boyce's record from one chapter in 
Irina Dortha Bacchus's The Reformed Roots of the English New Testament, 1980. The section on Boyce's notes in, I don't know how to even try to pronounce this guy's name, Monaru Kijakis, I don't know, Principles and Problems of Translation in, seventh, in uh, 17th Century England, 1981, has uh, subject the link between exactness and ambiguity it has as its subject, I should say. As its subject, Mike. Okay. The link between exactness and ambiguity in biblical translation. Olga S. Opfeld's The King James Bible Translators, 1982, a detailed survey of the progress of the translation, describes the work of the general meeting. In the making of the English Bible, 1982-1983, and in English translation of the Bible, the literary guide to the Bible, edited by Robert Alter and Frank uh, Kermode, 1987, Gerald Hammond points out, by way of examples, the translator's literary skills. Stephen Prickett brings uh, the notes into clear focus in developing his challenging uh, in developing his challenging idea ideas in words and the word Cambridge Press 1982 as does David Norton in his magisterial work a history of the Bible as literature which we need to put in italics Mike the title of Norton's book Samuel Hornsby's essay now I know this stuff doesn't mean anything to you guys okay you've probably never read this stuff I've read about four of these books that are in this list all right um, what he's saying here is that once the notes were accessible through published access, were they further studied by later scholars to bring and draw out more information from them than even he discussed in the book from 1969? So did they have an impact? The answer is yes. Many scholarly works have been written since the 1993 release of Allen's paperback edition of Translating for King James. It is important to note that between 1969 and 1993, here it is, I can find no pro-King James author covering the impact of Voices Notes upon the production of the King James Bible. So what I mean to say there is this, as I scour my books, I cannot find anything written by a clear King James Bible advocate who is utilizing Voices Notes to substantively talk about how the translation was made or what Voices Notes might, what insights or details Voices Notes might give us into understanding what happened there at the general meeting at Stationers Hall. This serves to accent and underscore a point that I have been making for quite a while now. The King James Only movement, as it has been constituted since the 1950s, so I, that's a very clear statement, since the 1950s, I'm not talking about what people believed in the 1800s or the 1700s. I'm talking about as we know it now that began and was constituted beginning in the 1950s, historiograph as, a, as a matter of historiography. And what I mean by that is when were these books, when were these major King James only works beginning to be written that shaped the movement as it is now? They were written in the 1950s. They began to be written in the 1950s, a little bit in the 30s. I've covered that in a lot of other teachings that I've done, okay? So let me read that, start that sentence over. This serves to accent and underscore a point that I've been making for quite a while now. The King James Only movement, as it has been constituted since the 1960s, enunciated a position on the King James Bible with zero input from the surviving primary work in progress documents. This has led to the propagation of information about the King James Bible that is not true and contrary to historical fact. Okay? Now, folks, that to me, some people are going to hear me say that and they're going to think, oh, well, he's a modern version advocate or he's this or he's that. No, I'm just telling you the truth. I, I can go through, I can see the shelf, I can see the volumes on the shelf, and I can point to things in every one of them that was said that if they would have known about these documents and taken them seriously, they would not have said what they said in those books. Not the entirety, not everything that's been written, but a, f a fair amount. Okay? Now let's stop there. Does anybody have any questions or comments about that? See, that's where people 
either they're either I'm not explaining myself well, which is a probably good possibility. People aren't paying attention or they're only hearing what they want to hear. But this is why what we're doing here in this class, in my opinion, is important. Somebody who is a King James Bible believer needs to go through this stuff, draw out the information and put it forth in a way, not in a way that's critical of the King James Bible, but serves to support it accurately based upon relevant historical information. So, any questions before we look at the last point? No? No questions? All right, we'll move on. Review work in progress timeline. So, let me, where's the markers at? Okay. Please recall the following work in progress timeline from lesson 165. All right? So we identified six or uh, three stages. Stage one is the six companies, six company draft work. I'll just say it like that. So you remember that Archbishop Bancroft, did he deliver rules that they were supposed to follow? They divided up into six companies, two at Oxford, two at Cambridge, two at Westminster. They were each assigned a different section of the text. So the, uh, for example, the second Westminster company that produced Manuscript 98, they were tasked with the New Testament epistles, all right? A different group was tasked with the Pentateuch. A different group was tasked with the Gospels and the Book of Acts, etc. Okay, so this is the six stage one is the six companies working on their draft work, and we could say roughly that stage one is 1604 through 1608, roughly. Okay. Now, what do we have from that time period? We have MS. Ward B, which is the work of Samuel Ward. So just say S. Ward. And this is his work on 1st Esdras through Wisdom 3 through 4. So that manuscript fits what period? Stage one. So let me, I'm, look, I'm getting blanks there, so let me explain. That manuscript right there and it is his handwritten translation of that part of the Apocrypha that he was assigned to work on. Okay? Then we have, also from stage one, we have Manuscript 98 at Lambeth Palace Library, represents stage one work of the second Westminster Company. So second we have MS 98, okay? And then third here we have Bod 1602, the hand, the uh, annotated Bishop's Bible, it's this document right here. 1602 Bishop's Bible with the handwritten notations of the translators in the margin as they're conforming the text from the bishops to what would ultimately become the King James. We've talked about that in great detail. So these documents here, Man Ward, Manuscript Ward B, at Manuscript 98, Bot 1602, those are all indicative of what I'm calling Stage 1. Okay? Look at the next, Stage 2. And I always don't have enough room. Stage 2 would be, I have it in the notes as 1609 through 1610. And we're going to call that the general meeting. Possibly meetings, plural. We'll talk more about that in the next lesson. So from this time period, we have two things. Number one, we have um, the notes of Boyce. And second, we have the letters between Boyce and Kasubon discussing how certain passages should read. Okay, so we have 
those two stages. So we have stage one, the draft work of the six companies. We have roughly three primary work in progress documents that fit stage one. Stage two would be the general meeting or meetings. We have the notes of Boyce and we have the letters between uh, Boyce and Kasselbach that are clearly datable. These two sources here are clearly datable to 1610 based upon internal evidence that we can verify very easily. So that's stage two. Then stage three, which I don't have room to write. Stage three is gonna happen in 1611, which is the actual printing of the text. Everybody with this? All right. So two men, Thomas Bilson and Miles Smith, in stage three, work with the King's printer, Robert Barker, to see the text through to the press. And there are two 1611 printings, then, that would be the, the primary documents for stage three. There are two different runs of the, of the Bible in 1611 that would bear witness, then, to the final decisions of the translators in 1611, okay? So we've got stage one, stage two, stage three. Completeness dictates that we also note the following, yet understudied slash unclassified works that could one day, that could one day need to be added to our list of primary work in progress documents pending further study. They are a Greek Old Testament at the Bodleian Library with copious marginal notes by John Boyce, and second, Isaac Kasuban's notebooks, also at the Bodleian Library, recording conversations that he had with another translator, Andrew Downs. Okay? So, when we're talking now about the general meeting and Boyce's notes, we are talking about this stage in the process. We are talking about the companies have done their work, they turn the work over to the general meeting. The general meeting is going to give the work a final review before the text is ultimately printed in 1611. So this is sort of the general, the general review meeting here, sort of the final toll gate, if you will, before the work is ultimately going to be published. So what's published in 1611 is the result of a process that started way back here in 1604. Okay? Everybody following that? Now, it's real important that you guys understand that. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay, so lastly, bottom of page 7, lastly, Facebook friend and fellow researcher Christopher Yetzer furnished me with the following horizontal timeline for your consideration. Please note that Brother Yetzer's timeline divides Bod 1602 Old and New Testament into two different sections on the timeline. This is illustrative of a technical point regarding the document that we have not yet discussed. And actually, we have discussed it now. Need to update that last sentence there. But we can look at the chart here, okay? <clears throat> so, let me bring up the notes and put the chart on the screen. So, if this, is bottom, this is page 8. Here is the timeline that Brother Yetzer has presented, okay? So, we start... So the docu so this chart is by Christopher Yetzer. <clears throat> the dashed lines are possible time of document creation. The gray lines are the possible duration of the event. And the red lines are more assured duration of event. So he's broken this down a little bit different. So we have 1604, stage one is the setup. So he's got it broken down just a little bit differently. Stage two, he has as the individual groups translating, okay? And notice across the top then, We've got Bod 1602, New Testament, early, manuscript Ward B, and manuscript 98, okay? Then as we work our way through time, we come to um, the general review here. He's got it broken down a little bit different, but he's got manuscript Buried 360, Boyce's Notes, and the Bod 1602 portion of the Old Testament. Uh, final review, and then review by Bil Bilson and Smith, and then finally stage 7 is printing. So he's got sort of more stages on his chart. He's got all the same information. He's got it laid out a little bit differently than what we have over here. Okay, but it's basically this, essentially the same information. The other thing that he has done is he split the witness of Bod 1602. The New Testament section he takes as more reflective of early work, and he takes the Old Testament section as more reflective of later work. 
based upon, uh, you can you know, do a real technical analysis and probably surmise that that's correct, okay, as far as that breakdown is concerned, okay? So we've got different formats. So the bottom line that you guys need to be aware of is the following. When we now start talking about voices, notes, and the general meeting, we're talking about this right here. We're talking about one of the final toll gates before the thing actually gets printed. So, anybody got any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Has it divided into seven stages? Yes. Are part of those included in your page two then? Mm -hmm. the general meeting? Okay. So he he has the setup before they start as its own stage. So let me just speak to that for a minute. It is at the January 1604 Hampton Court meeting that the decision to translate is made. But it takes time to get the project underway. The rules are drafted by Bancroft, the translators are chosen, the committees are formed before the, the actual work begins. So what Brother Yetzer has on his chart is he has the setup phase as its own stage. What I have here doesn't even include the setup. What I have, what I have here that my chart or my stage starts with all that is already been done and the work is now underway. So he starts his at a different spot and he calls that stage one. Now, uh, Brother Yetzer and I have discussed his chart. Uh, I gave input on his chart actually. He asked me to give input on it. And I think it's a fine chart, uh, but it's, it's, just, it's just a little bit more precise than the general overview that I'm giving you there in the notes, okay? Now, any questions about that? I, I heard the uh, Poppers Cup mentioned a couple of different times. Where did that, where did that end up? Or what exactly is that? So we've talked about the Apocrypha uh, a couple different times. Um, Coverdale, his, the first complete English Bible, by complete I mean Genesis to Revelation in English in one book, was Coverdale's Bible. Coverdale took the apocryphal books, books that the Catholic Church accepts as Scripture, but that the Protestants denied as Scripture, and places them in its own section between the Old and the New Testament. Okay? That became standard Protestant way of treating the Apocrypha in their printed editions until they just removed it altogether. Conversely, a Catholic Bible has all the Apocryphal books you know, inserted into the Old Testament as though they're canon. Okay? So, the Coverdale Bible, the Matthews Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the King James Bible, all have the apocryphal sec the apocrypha in it, in its own section, marked apocrypha, with notes at the beginning that it was not to be considered authoritative scripture. But at the time, it was all still part of the liturgy, and there was a lot of political things going on. So they include it in its own section and basically mark it apocryphal. The King James Bible has the 1611, had the apocrypha in it because of the rules that they were given. A, a certain company, and I can't remember which one off the top of my head, is tasked with translating the apocrypha. And Boyce and An Andrew Downs were on that committee, one of the six, that was charged with the apocryphal section. Okay. What does the Catholic Church feel the significance of that is? Well, the Catholic Church view, the Catholic Church views apocryphal material on the same level as you do the Book of Romans or Ephesians. In other words, they view them as scripture. The Protestants do not. So your Bible that you have doesn't even have the apocrypha in it anymore. At some point in the 1600s, the Apocrypha was just removed totally from all Protestant editions. But in 1611, it was still there, and there's reasons why it was still there. In fact, in, 16, in the mid-1616s, sometime between 1611 and 1620, the Archbishop of Canterbury said that all English Bibles had to include the Apocrypha on pain of punishment 
from the church. Okay, so like, and then eventually they just they just drop it. There's one of the first editions to drop it was a printing of the Geneva Bible where the page numbering just skips from Malachi to Matthew and it's clear that they just left it out of that printing. So, Ken, if you want more information on the Apocrypha, I got a booklet on the back table, just uh, something, I forget the exact title, but it's about the Apocrypha and the King James and the history of the Apocrypha and why it was included at that time, if you want to pick it up. Any other questions? Now, Somebody, somebody. One thing I want to mention before we go: somebody find Psalm twelve, six, and seven in your Bible. Psalm twelve, six, and seven. I need my my Bible's over there. My podium here is cluttered up with a bunch of other stuff at the moment. What? Could somebody read that out loud for me when you get it? Because the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So there is an argument that I would just simply call the purified seven times argument that says that the 1611 Bible is the perfect one because it's the seventh Bible to be translated from the Texas Receptus. Okay? I personally do not think that when David wrote Psalm 12, he was talking about a 17th century English Bible. He was talking about the words that he is writing in that chapter while he's writing them, the words that are there in 12, in Psalm 12. Okay? There's a preservation. I believe the passage is teaching preservation. But I don't believe that the purified seven times is a reference to seven English Bibles. In fact, if you look at it, read it again. As, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified how many times? That is a simile, folks. That is a literary device to describe how pure the God's words are. Uh, how pure are they? They are as pure as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified how many times? Seven, Seven times. I had an encounter just this week with somebody on the comments on YouTube who was talking about the 17th, the 1769 edition of the King James Bible, which is the one all of you have in front of you, being the seven purification, the seventh purification of the seven. So it is the way the Bible was intended to read, even though when you compare the editions, you know there are editorial things going on when we study the printed history of the text, right? So the idea that this, this person had was that, well, this is the seventh, seventh. So therefore, it is exactly the way it should be, okay? And the conversation was around the idea of the spelling of words throughly and thoroughly. And so the 1769 has to be the perfect one because that's the seventh of the seven. Now look, you, you can believe that if you want. I don't think Psalm 12, I don't think tw Psalm 12 is talking about uh, 16th and 17th century English Bibles anyway. Not in the, by extension of preservation, yes, what we have is the result of the doctrine of preservation, but David does not have in mind when he writes that English Bibles 1500 years, or 2000 years later. He's talking about the words that he is writing there. They are pure words. The words of the Lord are pure as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, the words, thou shalt preserve them from this generation how long? Forever. There's a promise there of preservation. I think some preservationists, though, go too far when they take the seven and they want to say, well, the 1611 is the seventh, which I question their math on anyway. How do you count these things exactly? What verse tells you how to count them? Do we count the Tyndall 1526 or do we count the Tyndall 1534? Does it count twice or does it only count once? What about the Bishop's Bible? Do we count the 1569 Bishop's, 1568 Bishop's Bible or the 1602 Bishop's Bible or the 1593 Bishop's Bible? Which one are we supposed to count? 
And how many times does it count? You see what I'm saying? I'm like, a lot of that, some of those arguments don't make sense to me. Now, I know they're very, they, they make for great memes on Facebook and social media, but that doesn't mean that they're true. Is the Word of God pure? Yes, it is. How pure is the Word of God? It's as pure as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified how many times? Seven. Seven. And would God preserve that which he inspired? Yes. Is the King James a translation of the preserved text? Yes. Is it the preserved Word of God for English-speaking people? I believe it is. You following me? All right. Well, we are about time. If nobody has any questions, we will be actually done a couple minutes early. <clears throat> Anybody got any questions or comments? All right. Purified seven times the old deck. So what would they do with the Word of God between 1611 and 1769? They didn't have the pure Word of God during that time. It was being settled, Ernie. <laughs> it was being purified still. Now that it was in English, it was still being purified. They're talking about the silver being purified seven times. It's, it's, it's a, yeah, I mean, the verse is clearly a simile, as the words of the Lord are pure. I, I'm getting it right, right? I don't have, the words of the Lord are pure words, right? Yes. yes. That's what the verse says? Absolutely. As silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. How pure are the words of the Lord? They are as pure as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. So they're pretty darn pure. And the words are always there because if you try silver, you're just heating it up so that the dross rises to the top and you skim that off. Correct. And then you heat it again and do the same thing. So what's left is pure, sil pure silver, pure word. Yeah. So when God gives his word, he gives it pure without any what? Without any dross, without any error, without any falsehood. Okay? You with me? All right. If there are no questions, next week we will be back. Lesson 180, and we are going to flush out more details now about John Boyce's notes and what happened at this general meeting.